Yay. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening with our talk with Jamal Barber. This is our fifth talk of the year and our second talk of our fall term. We also have one more talk programmed in December. So be sure to visit our website at manhattangraphiccenter.org so you can register for them. And while you're here, you'll be able to sign up for our mailing list and see other events and course offerings. And to say that, we actually just went live with our winter spring term today. So we have classes on our website that are available for registration. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Threads to keep up to date with our um, daily ongoings. If you're not familiar with our organization, Manhattan Graphic Center is a community print shop that supports the learning and practice of fine art printmaking. We provide an affordable, inclusive, professional studio and exhibition space. Plus, we offer classes and other public programs, including artist talks like this one, and also offer scholarships. The Manhattan Graphic Center would like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council of the Arts, and our members and our other donors and friends, all who make our artist talks and other programming possible. Thank you for joining. My name is Aneda Cardona, and I am joined by my colleague, Kay Sarantonio. We're both part of the Manhattan Graphic Center Center's four-person management team, and we're very excited to welcome Jamal Barber to our Artist Talk series. We'll be doing a Q&A after the presentation. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat and um, that you see at the bottom of the screen. Sorry about this, I'm reading. Um, so a little bit about Jamal. Jamal Barber recently completed his MFA in printmaking at Georgia State University. Before school, he worked as a full-time artist doing exhibitions and commissions for companies across the country. Jamal's work has been published with Twitter, The New York Times, Penguin Random House, Black Art in America, and Emory University. His work has been included in the Dakota Arts Festival, Atlanta Print Biennial Show, Print Austin, and the Center for Contemporary Printmaking. He says, I found my artistic voice in the process of printmaking. I love the direct nature of relief printing. My style is bold, graphic, my style is bold, graphic form with the intricate carving of patterns. I work into the prints with screen printing, acrylic paint, drawing, and whatever other medium will help me achieve the texture and style I'm looking to achieve. My prints make social commentary about the issues I see affecting the black community. I express the anger, the pride, the pain, and the triumph of Black life. And now I'll hand everything over to Jamal. Okay. Welcome, Jamal. All right. No, thank you. I appreciate y'all y'all having me today. And actually, you know, you just said everything right there, so we can go ahead and get to. Uh, <laughs> <hang> on. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fine. Uh, yeah, thank you so much um, for inviting me to do this. I love doing this kind of stuff. Uh, I recently got to go to New York and visit the Manhattan Graphic Center. And, you know, printmakers, man, it's something about going somewhere and meeting other printmakers. That is, that's just a wonderful thing. Like, you know, I'm I'm here at the in Atlanta, at the Atlanta Printmaker Studio. I've been a member for years. I don't even remember how long I've been. <laughs> I've been at the Printmaker Studio. Um, and we were talking before about how awesome it is just to get and relate to other people that nerd out on the same things that you nerd out on and you know get in there and share and talk and so that hopefully with this talk is the same way where yeah i'm gonna I'm talk and it's about me today but really i love the engaging conversation with everybody so if you have questions even while i'm talking you know throw them in the chat and we'll see how we can guide this conversation so it's not just me up here running my mouth like i love to do about prince but you know it's us we can have a good time together and, you know, learn something, share some ideas, all that good stuff, everything to make printmaking great, right? Uh, so I'm going to try to share the screen right quick. And now uh, first part of this is going to go through um, a little presentation that I whipped up um, showing uh, most of my print work. And hopefully, uh, to, you know, everybody can learn a little bit about me and uh, see some examples of my work. And we'll talk about kind of the process excuse me, an evolution um, to me that happened uh, as I, like she said before, discovered myself with printmaking. Um, you know, how we all grew up. Oh, first, 
Jamal Barber, this guy right here <laughs> that you're looking at on your screen. My website, jbarberstudio.com. I'm at jbarberstudio on uh, Instagram and threads and all that good stuff. So you can find me on social media. Please do reach out. I love to connect and talk with people. I definitely follow you back if you follow me. Uh, so, you know, always looking to see some great prints. And so this guy's the best photograph I ever took in the art studio. I'm always jealous seeing people on Instagram with these amazing photos. And I'm just by myself in my studio doing nothing, <laughs> trying to look good. And so a little bit about me. Um, like she said before, I got my BA in communication arts from East Carolina. Uh, my MFA from printmaking at Georgia State. And if you notice the gap, we might talk about that gap a little bit. It was, uh, it was a good 18 years between me graduating in and going back to get my MFA. Um, I have worked for Twitter, New York Times, Random House Publishing, Microsoft, Smithsonian Channel, Brennan Center for Justice, uh, Black Art in America, Emory University. This is just a, a small sample of what I've done, done work. Um, also done murals and painting projects for the Shack Foundation, um, all kinds of stuff. You know, anything art related, I can get into and make a little bit of bread. And that's what I'm all about. I've done shows at Syracuse, uh, USC Chapel Hill, Emory, Sanford University, Columbus Museum of Art, uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, all kinds of places. And I do host and talk and do a podcast uh, called Studio Noise. It's a art podcast uh, featuring Black artists, us having conversations, telling our stories, having a good old time, sharing and stuff like that. And I, you probably see me on Hello Print Friends, and uh, I love your work and been featured in Press and Matters Magazine. That's just a little bit if you want to uh, go check out some other stuff uh, after we go through this talk. If I don't bore y'all to death uh, with my <laughs> with my rambling, all right? So if we're having a conversation about print, I'd love to start with this one, uh, which is uh, very important to me, especially more now than than ever before. Um, for the longest time, I wanted to be a watercolor artist. And I don't know if y'all ever tried to do watercolor before. It's extremely hard, especially when you look at uh, really big names, really impressive people uh, that are using watercolor in such a finesse way. To develop that finesse is so frustrating. And I couldn't, I had a very hard time getting it. Never gave up though. I was still trying. It never quite happened, <laughs> never quite clicked for me. Uh, and so during that time, I was doing that in acrylic paintings, kind of just doing some regular artwork that may or may not have meant anything to me. I think the idea of being an artist and selling was more important to me at that time. And somewhere along the line, I went to see, uh, went to the art store, Bonders down here in Atlanta, to get some more, more paint. And they were doing a screen print demo. It was Jason Kafke. I discovered who it was. I remember who it was not too long ago. And he was doing a screen print demo right there at the art store. And for some reason, something about it clicked for me. It was just kind of like seeing how he did the layers, how he was managing. It was sort of the same techniques that I was using in watercolor. But here, it was moving towards finish in a much quicker capacity. And so something about that moment resonated with me so much that I uh, just fell in love with it. Like I bought everything I needed to screen print that day. It was books, it was YouTube University, it was studying, it was trial and error, but I eventually realized what I needed to do my screens, to coat the screens, to store the screens, to expose the screens with a 300 watt light bulb in my closet. Uh, it took me 22 minutes <laughs> per screen to expose the screen, but they all came out great. And that's how I got to this print, which was the second print that I ever finished that was that was could be considered finished. Uh, which was about my grandmother. And I recently lost my grandmother uh, about a month ago. And that was such a hard journey. So this really means a lot to me, just in terms of when I got the chance to truly break away from all of my expectations of what it had to be, what watercolor should look like to be successful. But because I didn't know any screen printers, didn't know any printmakers, I got to redefine myself. I got to really express and think about when I close my eyes, what is it that I see that I want to communicate? And I see Littleton, North Carolina. That's where I grew up at, small town. At the height, Littleton, North Carolina was 1,300 people um, in the whole city. And it's much lower now. So it's so, so much lower that they actually closed 
the elementary school that I went to because there are not enough kids for it to do. So they had to merge schools. It's a very small town, but it is, and I, people don't believe me when I say this, but North Carolina is still segregated. Like having, living in Littleton, North Carolina, where it is mostly a black side of town, mostly a white side of town, uh, Rhode Rapids, North Carolina, has a black a black high school and a white high school. Um, and they rearrange the school district and they redraw the maps uh, around people houses to maintain a certain social order. And I grew up mostly around black people. My my school was 95% black. In my elementary school, middle school, and high school, I didn't have a meaningful conversation with a white person until I got to college. And that was my first college roommate where the, when I actually started to relate to and understand other people, but until that point, my entire world was this black experience, but it's the black experience in a much bigger terms than when you think about it, where I do get to see people that do become lawyers, that do become doctors, that do uh, own businesses, they do stuff. And also seeing people that are winos, that are, are on drugs, that have done uh, crazy things and ended up in prison. So there's a whole spectrum of what black life would be. And it's about what has resonated with you. And in my life, my grandmother, she was the major art the center of our family for decades. And this print was dedicated to her to show kind of the heat of the South, the quilting of the South, her maintaining with these two kids, um, all the focus being on her, this kind of look in her face, this kind of black pride. And that became the jumping off point for me doing something that truly meant something to me. And so even in this talk you're here, I may do, you know, 10% uh, of it is technique and know-how and knowledge about the, about the processes. And it's 90% passion, right? It's 90% about what do you want to say and how do you want to say it and doing it in such a bold way that communicates my feelings, relieves my frustration about it and how I relate to the art. And so after I did a couple of these screen prints, and mostly it was in that kind of Photoshop style where I prepared everything with collage on Photoshop, um, uh, separated the colors, printed them, and then printed it like that. Um, along the way, I remembered I did do take one printmaking class way back in the day. I actually got my degree in graphic design. And I remember the feeling of it. I was like, you know what, let me try it again. So that's when I picked up woodcuts and I just took to it. It was another thing that was, just became so natural because I also didn't know that many printmakers. I know a lot now. Um, but at the time, I got to discover myself and see what I wanted to say in the techniques. And so I think you see a lot of graphic design in what I do um, because it is very much very clean, very um, what am I trying to communicate and how, how to communicate, just that thing, because I don't want you to deal with it and, and obfuscate and uh, ignore the point of what I'm making. So when I had this series, which is called the Identity Series, I'm thinking about my interactions that I had with authorities at that age, and you know, when I was younger. And it's always, it's always an issue. It's always some kind of problem. It's always, I'm not just Jamal, whoever I am, but I am this Black suspect that people are talking about. So um, when you do are having a regular normal day and having a good old time. But when I can counter police, it's not that I'm a college graduate, that I'm a father, that I'm a homeowner, that I pay my taxes, that I do all these things. It is that I'm a black suspect, whoever they might be looking for at the time. It robs you of your identity. It robs you of your humanity to be accosted and treated in such an unwarranted kind of way. And so I began to explore these ideas just in terms of the 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 violence that is that occurs when you have been subjected to this kind of treatment it feels like a normal thing and i think we've normalized it over time but it is a very jarring thing to just be going about your day and suddenly be harassed uh in these kind of ways and so when you think about portraits of people um the eyes are very important because you want to be able to identify and look into the the windows of the soul of this person. Um, and literally in these portraits, in this series, I take that away from you. 
because that part of you that makes you who you are that that um separates you from everybody else the kind of look of you and yourself the proportions of your face get completely miscued because you don't get to be yourself in these situations you have to conform to the authority uh, and so all the titles are incomplete assertions of identity like you don't get to quite be yourself you still get in this, especially in this picture that texture of your hair the fullness of your lips the darkness of your skin you're still you but you're not you in a way that I recognize you by name and give you proper respect and appreciate your humanity as an individual. And so the violence of that is is made by slashing the eyes and taking it away. I think in the next picture you see here, I actually used a hatchet on the wood to take that, to be a part of that stripping away of humanity, to you know, add that aspect of violence into it. Uh, and so with this direction, I began to kind of alleviate myself of some of the feelings. It's kind of you're always looking for a way to to tell people that this is happening and to, you know, buck against the system to try to uh, make people understand um, what's happening. Because I think the part of that, that humanity is expressing understanding. And this piece was a, a big journey for me. And I think it was a turning point into a lot of my work became super active, like super um, pointed like much, much more about transferring the feeling and making sure that we were understood and less about what it meant to other people. Um, and somewhere along that line, I think it, I get to this trueness and this idea of how pure my thoughts are and how much it relates to other people because so many people can get it and understand that feeling by looking at it. And I think that's the beauty of art, to connect with people over space and time. Um, People I may not know. I look back at uh, and got this print to be free up, and it's very much um, Catlin inspired. It's very uh, Catholic Collowitz inspired. Um, a lot of Hale Woodruff and how I approach prints. And it's funny how I can look at a Hale Woodruff print from the 1920s and still see aspects of that work that relates to me now in 2000, whatever, right? Uh, and it's that kind of timelessness. Um, pureness in a way that you communicate these ideas um, that I appreciate in artwork. Um, and this one, I've really turned a lot towards not carving as much as, as carving, right? Just to get like through shapes and letting the black be black and the, the I can direct you to just the pure expression that I'm looking for. Is it is it okay? Can people still hear me? I think there's a really brief, yes. brief, but we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. And so to be free is another one of those pieces where I wanted to be really pointed in what I'm what I'm getting at. Because it was much more about communication than it was about um making money or, you know, being in the right positions. Cause, you know, there are certain things that you could do to be to find success or think you can find success. Um, but the the most important important thing to me has always been the communication like how what are you saying how are you saying it in a, in a in a great way and I thought this piece was cool because it is this man standing proud and having these hands of oppression still pulling at him um reminds me a lot of Emory Douglas um when I think about it Emory Douglas was the um minister of culture for the Black Panther Party and he made some tremendous images that were very poignant, but mostly because they, I think they have power because they were made in that time and they communicated perfectly what the Black Panthers were trying to get at. And it became the visual language in which they used to relate to other people. And so he went much harder <laughs> than me in certain instances, but uh, I like the idea of it. Um, and so that brought me to uh, my first solo show that I put together of after I started printmaking, which was called Bright Black. And Bright Black was uh, me kind of laying out a, a marker in the sand to say, if I'm talking about Black people, if I'm talking about Blackness, what do I mean by Black? And what uh, what does it mean and how am I conveying it? And I think it's super important to be clear about that. And so I created a, a lot of new work for that, that show that to me still resonates uh, in this time. It's funny how you look back at some work and it's like, yo, how can... 
will I ever make anything this good <laughs> ever again? <laughs> but uh, this piece, duality, um, you know, talking about there was a there was a book that went along with the show that was called The American Color Theory, and I was taking language from actual color theory and relating it with imagery to relate it specifically to uh, issues of race in America. And I think it it started off to say that if you don't understand color in America, uh, you won't understand what you're looking at, right? And um, one of the one of the tenets was a certain amount of black complements every color. And that comes to this piece, which is about duality, which is when I enter a, a place, how, how black can I be when I go in here, right? Can I use my black slang and my black clothes and my style and the swag that comes along with how we relate and talk to each other, just cultural significance, or will I be punished for it? Will I be punished not just for my skin color, but how I'm acting will be judged in an extreme way. Even if I can be the smartest person in the world, I can have, I can, you've seen this with students and, and uh, high school athletes and all this kind of stuff where if they wear their hair with dreads, it's assumed that they're doing something that they're not. And that's part of the, the, the thought that you have to have as you're encountering as you're having these encounters, because I want my art and my my individuality and my spartness, my intellect, my um, my happiness, my <laughs> the way I bring joy into a room. I want all of that to speak for me. But the first thing to encounter is my skin color and my attitude and how I'm dressed. I'm judged to me harshly, um, and how that goes down. I've seen it happen with uh, tons of people uh, just based on where you are. And if you grow up in a certain place, it's not your fault that you act a certain way, that you have a certain accent, that you value certain things, um, but it can't be judged. So a lot of times, if you enter these environments, you have to turn to be the acceptable person if that's how you want to go. Like you have to have a different voice, have, you have to stand different, you have to act different, you have to you know, say different things. It's not necessarily how I would act at home with my family, right? And so this idea that you have to be these different people to survive now it's not as not as I can't say it all the time, but now it's not as essential to survival as it used to be, because even if you talk to older black men in the South, some of them will tell you stories about how they couldn't walk on the sidewalk with white children or something like that, like it had to act and be this certain way when that's not who you are on the inside. So that I think that's the story of blackness in a way. The council um, was to me one of my my favorite, my most important pieces uh, that come out of that show. This was a. It was also when I started working really large. This is a three foot by four foot woodcut, and I I love this piece because um, it's telling everything that I want to tell about how we communicate blackness. And I think blackness in America and how we're treated is not necessarily taught to you. I think it's learned through osmosis. I think you see it and you feel it. And I think you, it is transferred from person to person through the witness of other black people. And part of that is how much of it do you believe and how essential is it that I do take the word from some people that this restaurant is racist. Uh, if you If you hear enough that a restaurant is racist, do I have to go subject myself to racism to, to validate this opinion? Or will I listen to it, right? Uh, there was this book called The Green Book, which they, was a guidebook for people on where they could land, where they could stay if they were traveling across America and the South, certain safe places. And that was just a communication of, these are the dangers. This is what you can do. Uh, and uh, it's just a warning out there for you to go by. And I think a lot of things about blackness is communicated in that way. And so in this piece, you see these different figures as they all relate to each other and they move the story, the idea, the communication of blackness is portrayed from person to person to person until it gets to the more rendered figure in the middle, which is, you know, sort of me and me in actuality in real time. So all of this information is transferred across time. And if you see a face all the way to the right, which eyes are connected to my actual eyes, 
the eyes for that figure. I had to let you know that the next generation will see and define blackness by my witness as they go forward. And so it's a continuation of this uh, shared experience. Uh, around this time, I'm, I'm a very curious person. I'm very experimental with how I do stuff. And so it, it's not enough for me just to do a straight edition of prints. I also started to dibble and dabble into a lot of other um, instances of using printmaking, not just as print, the print itself, the edition, but as print of material that you're using in the furtherance of another idea. And so this is when I started to use my woodcuts and screen printed um, collages and words and stuff to make mixed media pieces. And so the two faces are woodcuts and everything else are sheets of patterns, black and white, and the words are black and white together. And then it's glued down on this panel. So I think this panel is, I want to say is 40 by 48. It's a pretty large piece. And it's meant to kind of highlight the kind of models. And I, you know, like I, I fell, really fell in love with Emory Douglas' work around that time. And I like the idea of text and image working together. And so this series had a, a few different pieces and they all had kind of a theme. They all had a way that I was describing a person in a neighborhood because every neighborhood has these people that serve a function, right? And so in every community, there's always a builder. There's always a somebody trying to make alliances. They're always trying to get people to work together to form the homeowners association or to put their money together to buy a building or make a playground. Like it's always these leaders. Sometimes they become city councilmen and stuff like that. Um, but they were always, they go forward with the idea of strength through unity that if we all work together, we can have more power than just our individualized ourselves and that we can get more done to better our communities. Uh, this one was another piece in that series that was called Be American. So I also started to explore the idea that these variants, these instances of everything that is printed can take on different functions depending on how you use them. So it's the same faces uh, from the last pieces, um, but with a different context and different message and to see how many of those different instances I can do. And so if you are, there's always this big red line uh, and when you talk to people about how much Black people should embrace their own culture and how much they should conform to the culture of the majority. And so there at times we can be, I'm African-American, and they'll tell you, be American, to choose to go with the majority because that's the right thing to do and not your individualized thing. You know, that's a, I, I think that's a, a controversial thing to say that make people uh, uh, give up their own culture for the favor of some other random thing that's been assessed to people, but that the goalposts will constantly be moved and you never actually get to the thing that you want to get to. That's what I get. Again, I'm back to using those same patterns, those same screens that I was using. I uh, wanted to tell the story of my wife and her natural hair journey. Um, it struck me because as she was going through this thing, I, you know, as a guy, I just go cut my hair as whatever. Um, but for black women, it's, it's such a big thing for them to be presentable, right? To have the same things done with their hair, the care and consideration that they have to have and how they're judged for the ways in which their hair simply exists. Uh, my wife, um, if you don't know about kind of a natural hair journey for Black women, uh, they stop perming their hair, which is adding the chemicals to straighten it. Um, obviously, straighten hair more acceptable in workplaces and stuff like that. But it was this kind of turning point during the early 2000s where women would stop doing that and just go back to the natural. So the first thing you had to do was stop perming your hair, let it grow out, and then you cut all your hair off. And then now, from that point forward, you'll get your natural hair untextured coming out of your head. And that was where you want it. Now, with all sort of problems with perming your hair in terms of the chemicals that are involved that are basically burning your hair 
burning people's scalps, um, giving them all kinds of uh, cancer, cancerous diseases and stuff like that. Uh, and so going on that journey, I noticed how she was treated when she got her hair cut. She was the same person. She got a PhD in chemistry, got a master's in biochemistry. She's super smart. She's a teacher, but they still treated her different um, just because of her hair. Nothing else had changed about her. Um, the more that she talked about it, the more that she mixed these chemicals and oils on the stove, not chemicals, but oils, natural ingredients on the stove to to condition her hair, to take care of it. You realize how much your hair lives and breathes, how it changes. It's affected by how much you slept, like what, what time of day it is, what's the weather outside, how much water did you drink? All of this stuff affects your hair in ways that you, as a man, don't have to deal with. But as black women, they have to be hyper aware of, especially if they want to be healthy and live uh, more free. And so I did a whole Afrolicious series where I use the same textures, but different colors and different faces um, to express moods, right? To see how your hair changes shapes. If you just have an Afro, just a regular Afro, and you take pictures every hour, the shape of your Afro changes like over time. I think that's fascinating. <laughs> so it's like different aspects that you find interesting. I'm more likely to go for it. I'm more likely to explore those things uh, and not, not so much operate on like, yeah, the other piece that I made was successful to be free sold out, such and such sold out. But I still want to communicate and express the thing because I think these stories about what's happening is very important um, to put down and think about. Um, me and my wife, uh, my wife is, I talk about her a lot, <laughs> or she is uh, my everything. Um, I judge my art by by my wife, which is funny. Uh, most people, <laughs> it's funny when I tell people that if I show my wife a piece and she automatically gets it, then I know it's too easy. I know I got to keep working. It's not, it's not complex enough. Um, but if I show my wife a piece and she's completely confused, I know I went too far. I know like, yeah, you know, that's all right. Then nobody's going to get this one. So to me, my wife's a regular person <laughs> and she's the most honest, regular person uh, that I know. Uh, because also because we've been together for so long, we married 17 years now. Um, I know her faces, <laughs> so I can get real time feedback on my work just by looking at her. And so as I do all this really heavy work, and I haven't showed a lot of the really pointed stuff here, but as I do this really heavy work um, and explore these kind of deep, emotionally draining concepts, this idea of, of taking on uh, white supremacist attitude in America of finding a way to be free and self-sustained. It's very dramatic, like dealing with the the trauma that comes along with seeing deaths on TV, you know, the whole George Floyd moment and all this kind of stuff. Trayvon Martin was my uh, guy that kicked me off uh, to having these experiences. I relate to it a lot and, it, and it's draining to be in that mode, you know, as you as artists, we're there 24 seven, <laughs> right? I'm always thinking about it, always going through the issue, always trying to express it. And if you stay in that mode too long, uh, it'll get to you. So I always go back to the series that I call Black Love. Um, and it, it's, it's just me and my wife just showing different ways that we can be happy as a couple and how much it means to me. It's, it's a great break from, from the heaviness of that, right? Uh, this is another one, Endless Love, using uh, these kind of traditional African figures and a lot of patterns, um, very clean pieces, very, very much about the communication and the bond between two people. Boys Become Men, this was around the pandemic time when I started making work about my son and my family um, that I hardly ever talk about. Also started to explore more color because for the longest time, I, I used black as my cipher um, for saying blackness, right? And so if you see black figures, then you can see black people. Um, later on, I realized how limiting that was, uh, especially going into the pandemic, I started painting. And when, the, when I started painting, I switched to just this idea that since I always use black and as much as that can be a good method to use, it is also limiting ultimately because I only start to see people as black and not all the other layers in which you can express it. So it almost becomes a crutch. 
um, for how you're using it. So how can I break through that? How can I use different colors uh, and still express the same thing? That that put me into a much different mind state, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic where uh, my struggle wasn't, and our struggle uh, overall wasn't so much with society because we were all at home, right? We were all stuck where we were. And so we're not dealing with the same issues that you think you were. Uh, it's a different kind of issue. You have to be a different person in order to maintain. I can't, I'm not just sit here raging against the system when I'm at home with my son, right? Riding bikes and and trying not to get sick and die like, you know, so many other people did. So part of that it was an embrace of color, an embrace of joy, an embrace of family, um, saluting people like uh, Elizabeth Catlett. But this is a kind of a piece related to her that involved, you know, started using stamps and started using different colors to express different things, which led to something wonderful, which was a piece that I did. It started off as a challenge to my my class at Georgia State. Um, I think I know I carve fast. I know I do. But my class carves incredibly slow. <laughs> so I was trying to tell them, like, I've given you a month to do this project. You don't need a month to carve a thing. Like, you don't. And so in the Thanksgiving break, I made this piece. And I made 17 different versions of it in, like, three or four days just to show them, like, you don't have to do this. <laughs> you could be more free, more, more certain of yourself of the mistake is not a mistake. That a mistake might be um, you getting to the style that fits you or or using your own tendencies to separate yourself. It could be anything, but it's all about the approach. And so this was part of the variation that I used. Uh, different stamps, different colors, different collage um, for the earrings are all like old paintings that I had that I cut up into the circles and used the template to put down. And so that became like a new exploration for my work embracing this idea of variety and not uh, not so much locked into the addition and process which you know can do which i do teach um but as i'm exploring subject matter i like to see where this thing can go if we just play around with it that idea of experimentation right of freeing yourself like really really being involved in the process and just trying to see what happens when you layer stuff uh, when you have a bunch of different colors, when it's not all just a plain, clear thing. And I think part of it is, as much as where angels go in specific, where this was about my man, George Knock, who passed away. Uh, he was an NFL running back, and he had bad knees. So when he passed away, I just imagined him as an angel being free, finally, to move around like he felt like it. he always had problems with his knees and his back uh, because of his time with the New York Jets. And... It, I think it communicates just as much freedom, the, the plain one and the more layered chaotic one, right? All the different colors and stuff can have its own method of communication. And there's no guarantee because when I layer all these papers, I just print on top of it. Who knows what it's going to look like? And that's so exciting and so much fun. And I'll end it by just uh, briefly talking about my, because it's about prints mostly, and we'll get to questions, but I wanted to show a little bit of the evolution of my work from using the woodcut pieces into collages and paintings. So this is a huge piece, a six foot by four foot piece uh, that has the collage woodcut face and then roofing paper and metal hinges and all acrylic paint, all kinds of other stuff to build environments around it. And so that became, become, has become this new kind of wave that I'm on using the idea of material where using like a wood block, for instance, from one of my prints to create this kind of sculptural construction uh, that has its own uh, energy and life to it. That's much different than a print. So the print from this block looks and almost has nothing to do with this piece right here, which uses the wood block in a wood construction. And lastly, I ended off with my latest work, um, which is using all the really color vibrant and layering it um, into my prints to see if I can format another world that these people can exist in. That's not just us here in the struggle or us talking about the here or now on earth, but what if we are talking about another place? What happens if we all imagine ourselves always haven't been free and what would that look like? And I'm just having fun 
experimenting and doing that, still staying true to me, still staying true to the printmaking. Uh, because it's something about the wood, it's something about the carving, and that's techniques and the printing that I love. But then in that instance, you can still take it and go so many other places because it's almost infinite in the amount of variation that you can have uh, with the work that we do. So that is my slideshow and my talk. I hope everybody heard me and understood me. I hope I made some kind of sense as we go forward. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Samal, for this wonderful talk. Um, if it's okay with you, we can start taking questions. Yeah, I would love that. Um, if you have a question, uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask uh, Jamal directly. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Well, I first wanted to say thank you. Um, I follow you on Instagram and I'm a, I'm a printmaker and book artist, but I find your work very inspiring. Um, and you're very articulate. It's very um, moving the way you describe your artwork and um, thank you. Uh, my question is, how do, what's your process before you get to the block? Do you do sketches or do you have an image in your head that you're trying to um, go for before you start carving? Um, what is your process before you get to the, the printing block or the screen? You know, that it's interesting that the process has changed a lot over time. That mm -hmm. started off, and you can see from my uh, original pieces, the original screen printers that I did, they're very much Photoshop, very much um, clean. They were meant to be very clean. And now I feel like I've, I'm going more and more loose the more I do it. And so now, like in the, the last two pieces that I've shown, I do some line work for the faces, but it's mostly carbon. It's mostly just drawing with my tools and just trusting that whatever comes out is going to be what it is. Uh, that's taking a certain amount of confidence over time. But I I feel like I want to get looser, like even looser than that. Like I even want to just start carving on a block without doing anything. Like I started moving and doing ink wash drawings on my block and then carving that and seeing what it looks like. And Maybe it's not a full-fledged figure at all. Maybe it does just become this kind of abstract thing. Like inside the marks, it might be a figure. It might be a dog. It might, you know, be anything. Like that kind of experimentation. I'm, I want to move more towards it because I think that there's so much more freedom and adding this abstract nature to it instead of like purposely putting myself in this world. I can be in another world and express even more with the same amount of marks, right? And so the, the the size of the wood doesn't change because the paper doesn't change. So a 30 by 22 piece of paper fits uh, 20, <laughs> 24 by 18 right in the middle. That 24 by 18 space doesn't change. Your marks can change it and your marks can be a way to express something differently. And so I'm I'm much more about the expression. I'm much more about what is this actually saying more than does it look like the person, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm, I'm, I'm tending to be more loose, but in the beginning, I do do a lot of thinking about what I want to say. Um, anytime I start a piece, the first thing I write on my paper is what do you want to say? And I think it starts from there. And if you always stay true to that communication, it can survive a lot of things. Like at the end, when I started layering those papers, um, and then printed the angel on top of it. I have no idea what it's going to look like, right? And something is attractive about the randomness of it. And uh, part of that is communication in itself too, where life can't always be controlled as much as we as printmakers are. You have to have a certain balance of of uh, acid in your in your in your blend before you put it down. Like my man, uh, mix grit, Greg Santos, when he does it. You mix in the, the acid to etch your stone. It has to be a certain way all the time. So we're used to precision. How can you add that part of randomness to it? And then what do you get? Because I see so many, so many amazing printmakers that are doing it, and I and I love it. 
man, I want to get that thing. I want to, I want to be more loose. I want to be expressive. I want just like, I don't know what's going to come off this press. Like that part of it is uh, the fascinating part of it to me. Very good. Thank you. For sure. Thank you for asking and attending. Appreciate you. Any more questions? Um, I'll ask a question. Um, how big are your additions? And that piece that had like the red fence, is that an addition? And would you make multiple fences? You know, that just like the technical thing about additioning and all that. Oh, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, I tend to keep my additions low. Um, the most I would go on any addition is 20. Um, but I I actually usually keep it around 10 to 12. Um, and that's just me having ADHD and not wanting to spend all my time printing the same thing <laughs> over and over. Uh, but the fence pieces are, are they're part of a series. So I actually did make, um, there were four of them, four different fences. Uh, and I use different wood blocks for each one of them. I think it's on my website. If you look at it, jbarberstudio.com. Um, they were called the Red Liner Series. And, you know, I, I find myself less and less interested in additioning, right? Um, but as I'm, not that I don't do it, I, I do go back and forth into it. Me and um, my man from Sanford are doing a, a print portfolio coming up soon. And that, that'll have an addition of 25 in it. And so I think that'll be the most I've printed in a long time in terms of additioning. Um, because if you notice, uh, even there's something wonderful in the angel pieces, um, I'm interested in the idea of variation now because you can get so many instances of a thing. Each instance can be different and communicate something completely different, even though it's the exact same face. Uh, if you change the background color from red to yellow, you're communicating something completely different. And so I'm really into exploring that part of it at this time. Can, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, go for it. What's the perfect reaction from your wife? You said if she gets it, it's like maybe it was too easy and then she's real confused. So what are you looking for? Like kind of a nod, but a confusion? Uh, What's the yeah, perfect that's, reaction? That's a, that's a great question. She kind of looks and had this look of, huh, that's, a, that's nice. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. It's not too confusing and not too easy. She thought about it a little bit. It attracted her. And sometimes she comes back and like, show me that piece again. Then I know it's like, all right, that's it. Like now, now it's there. Like I got the attention. All my work has ever been, all my work has ever been slow burn. Like I've never been like, uh, you know, you see some of these artists that come out and they're showing work in the Guggenheim at 24. <laughs> you know, that's never going to be me. <laughs> Right. I've I've always do a show and somebody will walk past my work, they'll come back and see it again. Or they'll call me the next day and buy one. I never sell stuff at fairs like on the street interacting with people. But I've always had that slow burn with my work. So I've gotten used to it. Thank you for that's a great question too. This isn't a question, more of a comment. Um, I really like what you said about um, making work about with, you know, about your wife that shows the love in your relationship to sort of be like a buffer from what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day with your other work. Um, I I think the, the image duality really spoke to me. I think it's a beautiful print. And I think that um it's, it's really, um, it's really nice to see that you're talking about what's actually happening, but then also showing the other side of what actually happens in in a family and in a relationship and you know and how and how we're actually raised within our own um, homes and how we deal with the outside looking in. Um, so I just want to say I thought it was absolutely beautiful and and really touching. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And uh, that has been a journey for me too um, because um, early on in high school I read like the autobiography of Malcolm X and like a lot of other books along that line so not that I was militant but I, I was very much aware and aggressive in how I confronted these kind of things um, and even now I'm 43 years old 
I'm not out protesting as much as I used to. As I don't make as loud as noise as I used to. But even in that time, I have to say that I missed opportunities to express a version of myself and a lot of that work by just focusing on the protest, by just focusing on the issues. Because me now making work about being a Black father is just as much, if not more, who I am as the protester, right? Because as much as a lot of that stuff did affect me, me seeing my son, yo, it's hard for me to even talk about him without tearing up, without crying, because I love him so much, right? My daughter, if I could, if I could just be with her all the time, I would, right? That's who I am, just as much as the guy that's angry about George Floyd or the guy that is out trying to register people to vote so that we can flip Georgia, <laughs> right? And all this other stuff, like this is, is, is so much that happens in life that it's not enough time to express all the feelings uh, that we have. And it gets, it's different moments that define us too, where today I'm much more defined from hanging out with my wife today. We got a personal trainer so we can work out because I can stop being fat and lazy <laughs> sitting around, right? Uh, that says a lot about me just as much as the other stuff that I'm talking about. And it's all important. And it's just a matter of, we just don't, we're never going to have enough time to express what we want to express, not all of it. And so you just have to make a choice. And sometimes I need to be better about making a choice of showing the love and how much more that motivates me or how much it motivates me. And I don't tell people because it's not that I'm angry because I'm just angry. I'm angry because I love these people. I love my cousins. I love my nephews. And my nephews get pulled over and accosted for something. I'm angry because I love them. How do you express love out of all of it? And I don't think I've always done a great job at it. And, you know, you, you just get better and you try. And, like, you know, you start to make observations the older you get. And hopefully uh, by the time I do leave from here, I've done something that shows you everything who I am, you know, hopefully. Yeah, well, it's beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I like what you just said, particularly in your artist statement about being the Black experience, and it always it isn't just about protest, but it's also the hum human side of you. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering also that, because you uh, also referred to Emory Douglas, and I was wondering, how do you think where do you think black art as a as a subject is right now especially with black art in america has, has evolved and um, what are your feelings or your ideas or your observations about black art today that's a great question and i think it's 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 a complex way of looking at it for me because it's hard to separate what we know as black art that we are being put in front of us through deliberate uh, media entities to convey a message and what is actually happening, right? So if you go around Atlanta, I know plenty of artists that are doing tremendous work about the Black experience and about Black ways, but they are not the people that you will see every day. Um, so I do still get to see the people that are, to me, making really potent and strong work. Um, and I still see like the people that are being approved by media entities and stuff like that. And they're making wonderful work, right? I'm not, that's not to like downplay any part of what they're doing because they're being wonderful. Like Simone Lee is making tremendous work, right? But you're, you're going to be fed. And if you're not careful, you will see Kalita Rawls, um, uh, Simone Lee, you will see Kahende Wiley. You'll see a lot of these big names as the definition of what black art is when there's black art being made by unknown people that is just as powerful and that you all don't always get to see. So in some aspects, we have to look for the energy that we really want, right? Because uh, I'm not sure if, if Emory Douglas came out and was making work now, if he would be as celebrated as we are now because we see him in the context of history. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's in a great state. I think it's, it's so much tremendous Black art being made by a lot of different people on a lot of different levels. 
that it's hard to get a true sense of it just from what we are presented in magazines and stuff. Right. But if you, you know, if you go out on the street, if you visit some places, if you get to know some people and shake hands and go see some of these smaller shows that are not in the big major galleries, you see a lot of people expressing a lot of different sentiments that need to be expressed. Even if it's um, not just a black experience proper, but a black LGBTQ experience is being expressed. Like the black woman experience is being expressed in very specific ways. And so now I think there's a time where there's a lot of room for all of us to have these conversations. Everybody gets to have it because of the access to materials, the access to sharing, right? As, as horrible and, you know, much as I hate the social rhythm, <laughs> the algorithm on social media, like it's giving you a chance to see some really tremendous work that will probably never have been seen otherwise. And so I think it's in a, a wonderful state and it, it, you know, and it comes down to personal taste too, right? Because, you know, I don't I don't personally need to see too many um, Bob Marley pictures. Like, that's not my thing. But, you know, somebody really talking about their experiences, really saying something, breaking through with something that I've never seen or thought of before. I love that kind of stuff. And it's more of it out there than ever to me. Um, we can get into a big debate over whether it's good, <laughs> whether, whether you actually like it, whether you think it's um, moving the needle at all. Um, but just the opportunity to do it, I think, is something that we all need it and and that we have now that it, that is it's a gift. Like because when I was 15 in Littleton, North Carolina, I could never imagine myself being able to illustrate a book with black images and tell a black story uh, from where I was coming from, because the most you could awful hope for was to get you a land, get you some land and a job and a little car so you can drive around and drink on the weekends at Littleton with your friends under a tree or jump in the creek every once in a while to, you know, have some fun. Um, and so the expansion of possibilities, I think, is tremendous. I love it. I love to see it. I'm so interested in it. I follow a lot of Black artists, and I promote art, Black artists, you know, even on my podcast, Studio Noise. Y'all check it out. There's so many interviews with a lot of Black artists that you might not know, and they're making tremendous work. It's, it's so awesome to see it. Thank you. For sure. I appreciate you, Jane. Okay, I think you have anything. Uh, I don't want to like go too far over, but I guess just it's, this is sort of broad and you can answer it however you want. But like, what do you hope for your students? Because I know you're a teacher as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know like, what, my main hope, yeah. my, now my main hope for my students and it's different um, and they tell me it's different because it, it show that I teach them differently. I teach them with so much passion that I want you to know art is going to be hard. It's nothing easy about it. You can go get you a computer science job. And like my man did, went back and got a computer science job. He's making $175,000 a year programming games. He's having a good time. You can get this art degree <laughs> and you will be sitting in your basement by yourself <laughs> painting or making prints or doing something, struggling. Nobody might not never see your work, but will you still do it? That's mm -hmm. the thing, right? The people that are going to make it will sit in that basement by themselves and make those prints and be happy about it because that's the only thing that's going to get you by for a lot of years. It's the only thing that got me by. Nobody liked my watercolor pieces and I made them for years until I got to the thing that is now getting me recognized in places. And so I teach that. I teach like, you got to find the core. You got to like really look and, and do that thing. And if you do that thing, then it's all worth it because you'll keep doing it and you'll get to the point that you want to get to eventually. Um, but that point is going to be different for everybody. And I teach people how to draw. I teach people how to carve. I teach people how to print, but I don't want you to print like me, right? I look through their sketchbooks and I want to see like, what do you really got to say? Because that's the special thing that I think we need. We don't need more printers. We need artists. We need people that are making things that mean something. And not that uh, a landscape can't mean something, right? It does in that way. But they're thinking about it. They're doing it with intention. And so you got to find the intention. You got to find the passion because that's the thing that's going to sustain you. And we can do a lot of things to try to get success that's not guaranteed because as much as 
you know, Simone Lee, I talk about her a lot, as successful as she is, she was nearly homeless. As incredible as she was, she was nearly homeless in her in a part of her life. But that's the that's what the art is. She was still committed to the art even through all that circumstance. And so if I can teach you that, if I can teach you to love it, not just like it, but to love making prints. I love carving. If you gave me a chance to just sit around and carve all day, I would carve all day long. I love it. The smell of ink, the paper, I love every part of it. Everybody, y'all know, if y'all printmakers, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but if you don't have the love, if you don't have the passion, I can't teach you what it takes to be a, a artist or to sell anything. Um, because that's the thing that makes you special. And they're all special. And if I could get them to see, because I see them, and I'm so fascinated by young minds. I hate, I'm sorry I'm going so far over, but I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm fascinated by artists, especially young artists, because they are just on the cusp of figuring out something in a new world that has never been seen before. With the internet, with the opportunities that you have, the ability for you to gather references from all over the world and put something together and present it to people. like You have so much opportunity if only you loved it. If only I can get you yeah, I'm gonna I'm ask you to submit and turn into me an edition of five. But who's gonna print an edition of 10? Who's gonna print 15 of them, 50 of them? That person is gonna be the one that we'll see in the MoMA, right? We'll see them somewhere special. And I'm looking to, to put that spark in you and blow on it, right? Like, come on, like, you got it. I see it in you, you got it. It's that light, it's that that power. Um, and if I can get them to see that, then I feel like I've done something. That's well, a great question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, so much Danal. This was an amazing talk. And I think we can continue talking about um about all of this. Uh just a reminder that uh if you want to see more talks like this, um, you can log on to our website, manhattangraphicsinner.org. Um, this talk will be available on our YouTube, um, and so we can rewatch the conversation and um, look at the mouse work, which is absolutely stunning. So thank you so much, and I hope everyone has a happy holiday week as you celebrate. Um, thanks again for being such an inspiration. Oh, no, thank y'all for having me. Um, much respect and love to everybody. Keep making those prints, sharing with me, follow me on J Barber Studio, listen to Studio Noise podcast. Um, if you got chance, if you got time, watch me on the exhibit, um, the MTV show that's streaming on Paramount Plus. I did get to manage to be up there and I made a couple prints. Oh, <laughs> so cool. yeah, yeah, it is it'll be a great time. So I appreciate you. Y'all connect with me, follow me, I'll follow you back. We can all be a big printmaking family like we should. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much, Kamal. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.